<laughs> it's going to add to one that we've already done. Go by there on the weekend. Uh, building <laughs> orders. Another snack? No. <laughs> Is that a leftover piece of cake? Open a vacant building one. Yeah. Parking lot one. Yeah, it's full. Vacant building one. Yep. Got it. It's actually pretty good. Josh, or I guess it's Stephen. Stephen, you good? I was going to go to the Attorney General's office, but then we found some loopholes. We'll call to order the committee of the whole meeting. Can we please begin with roll call? Councilmember Allison. Here. Steely. Here. Connell. Here. Shemmers. Here. Coburn. Here. Musman. Here. Kern. Here. All right. Our first item, uh, Shannon from YWCA. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, so I am Shannon sander Walzine. I'm the Executive Director with the YWCA, and I have Angie Bloomfield with me here tonight. She's our Empowerment Center Director. And so we are um, here representing the YWCA, 106 years proud, serving our community. Um, we're a $2.5 million organization and 150 employees. And specifically here tonight, we're talking about our Empowerment Center. Um, we're coming off of a three-year contract with the city. Actually, we're still in it until June. Um, for uh, with $15,000 of TIF LMI funds. And so those funds um, we are using to serve the residents of Clinton to um, help with utility and rent assistance and deposits. Um, so basically in our empowerment center, what we do is serve the homeless and near homeless. And as many of you are probably aware, about one third of our um, community is living at the poverty level or um, living paycheck to paycheck. So they're one major illness, um, one emergency, one COVID pandemic um, away from losing their housing. And so um, we are the resource for our community. Um, call us and we are able to assist um, based on uh, the most demanding needs. And so we are here tonight to respectfully request another three-year contract. Um, we have increased our ask to $30,000. Um, we're hoping that you guys have found that it's a good partnership and a good use of the fund and funds in serving our community. And so um, Angie is gonna tell you a little bit about the increased needs that we're seeing due to the COVID pandemic. Um, it's actually, uh, we have a staff of three, two and a half, um, uh, that are working really, really hard to answer a hotline that is ringing off the hook, 20 to 30 calls a day, sometimes as much as 60 calls a day that we're answering and trying to have those individuals answer phones in addition to providing case management to people. One of the things that you can be proud of too is that your funds directly go to rent utilities and deposits, but our case managers go on to work with those individuals and address the issues that they're facing that put them in this position um, so that hopefully we're putting them on um, the path to success. And so I will turn things over to Angie. And then we did send a letter out to you because we were hoping to maybe make our time short so that we know you guys are busy. And let me just say, I am so impressed with your brains firing so quickly tonight <laughs> at this late hour because my brain is not firing that fast. When you do that roll call, they're like, so um, I will turn things over to Angie. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, members of the council. I won't keep you long. I sent out a letter with some staggering statistics that I look at every day. When I go in in the morning, this is the first thing I look at, and it's usually the last thing I share with Shannon at night before I go home, because it is quite daunting this year. Uh, we took some time a few weeks ago when we were preparing for this and pulled some numbers from a year ago and compared them to where we are now. And it would appear that we have a 200% increase in call volume in the Empowerment Center. Um, it, for me, this is my first year. So I wasn't here last year to um, really compare it. But I can tell you that since I took this position, it has been a whirlwind of needs in the community. The calls do not stop. Um, it is both challenging and rewarding. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, it's been very... Um, it's been very rewarding to come back home. I worked in the Quad Cities and I've always wanted to come back to Clinton and I chose this time to do so. And there's a very apparent need for this service. So I'm happy to be joining the Y and doing all we can to make a difference. And my very first task in coming back to town was to help with the relocation of the guys over at the Y building. And it was amazing to see everybody come together. So 
thank you all for being a part of that and letting me as a novice to the community if you will take part in that it's been a really good experience but nonetheless um, we have a need that I did not realize was going to be a task put before me when I took the job and I don't think any of us in this room were prepared for the needs from this pandemic so I'm I can share with you the staggering statistics that are before you if you like or what I could do is open the floor for questions that might be a little bit more useful for our time I I'd like to just comment and say thank you for all the work that you've done it's it's been a crazy year for all of us and not in the we're not in the homeless or uh, rapid rehousing or any of that type of thing and so it's it's got to be just outrageous right now for you um, especially as money draws <coughs> down and there's not a second yes. any kind of money coming out so I sympathize with what you're doing and I appreciate what you are doing so thank, thank you, you very much Councilmember Shemmers <coughs> No, we'll, we'll let him go first. Oh, Councilmember Musman, go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, are you expecting an increase as the guarantee for, uh, well, I guess you don't call it a guarantee, but they can't kick people out of their houses Moratorium. right now um, for lack of paying rent? We and are. Once that's lifted, are you looking to see an increase in all this? We are, we're actually gearing up for the termination of the moratorium. It's scheduled to be lifted at the end of March. And at this time, there's not been a lot of talk in an extension. Now, I know that there is some controversy about the moratorium, but from a housing services professional, I will tell you that we need that moratorium to come to an end tomorrow. It is creating a, an even bigger um, unintentional issue because landlords cannot move clients out. Tenants are staying put. We don't have turnaround and we need turnaround because we do not have enough housing, affordable housing, to continue to meet the needs. So the moratorium, as wonderful as it was intended, it is now causing some unintended consequences mm -hmm. and the housing programs cannot <coughs> keep up. And so what is gonna happen on the 1st of April is we are going to get flooded because landlords are preparing their documentation and they have been for almost a year now. So they're going to go to all of these units that are thousands of dollars behind in rent and they're going to issue notices of three days on those doors and there's not going to be a thing we can do about it. So we are going to get a flood of calls beginning April 1st. Now that being said, the state of Iowa does recognize this, thankfully, and they have established an access portal, which is going to launch in mid-March. Thank goodness. Um, so they've established a portal. It's online. So everybody's going to go to the portal and apply. And if they have a COVID element to their past due rent, they're going to be funneled a different direction than those individuals that do not have a COVID piece. So they're going to help us filter some of the calls, which thankfully, uh, <laughs> because I have been dreading it. Um, but again, funds are going to be limited. And so what's going to happen when the floodgates open, everybody's going to be competing for that same pot of money. And when it's gone, it's gone. So we do have, we do have to prepare, we have to be ready for that. But at this point, I think we need to just lift the moratorium, face the, face the you know, outcome that's gonna have and just move to the other side. At this point, that's just all we can do. Do you have an idea of what kind of increase you're looking at? At this point, we don't. Um, we currently have a waiting list of 106 individuals on our internal list. And our current caseload is 75. And all of those have a COVID piece to them in one way or another. I and mean, you can delve down into anybody's situation and find some sort of COVID piece to their current circumstance. Mm -hmm. but once it's lifted and people are forced to move i think we're going to get an even you know it's going to be even bigger because right now there's a lot of people that are in our in our terminology landlords call them squatters mm -hmm. they're not paying because they don't have to and so they're not seeking services so if i were to guess what we're going to face we're going to have at least another 100 to 200 calls once those three-day notices go out mm -hmm. and are we really prepared probably not I, I, I don't know how our two and a half people are going to manage all of that but we're going to find a way mm -hmm. councilmember shemmers yeah you mentioned er earlier on 
uh, when you first started this, is your statement with us, uh, relocation, was that from the YMCA building? That we did. We Yes, I was, uh, Matt, I think I was on the job in three weeks, and Matt and I met. And, Shannon uh, said she wanted to start you off, you know, with a tough thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you all. <laughs> yeah, the, the, YM, the YMCA building. Well, and I just, I think that's outstanding, and it does show the resources. Everybody working together can get something done, and that's what it does take, is it does take the community. And obviously, you're well. You're uh, a big part of that. So thank you on that part. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Um, just one thing. I, I think I need to make a notice that I am an employee of the YWCA as a lifeguard, mm -hmm. but this is a totally different, <laughs> you know, kind part of. of what the Y the YW does. So you know, I, I'm not um, going to recluse myself or anything, but I want to make sure that. That's out there. <laughs> and, and for your, for your, <laughs> I'm a member. <laughs> no, they do some great stuff. I mean, yep. and it's too bad that this is the situation we're in. Who would have thought it, though, right? And you guys were handling a lot. <laughs> you guys were handling a lot before we added to it. And who knows what's going to be next? Is the scary part. We're doing the best we can to prepare. Yeah, I know you guys are, yeah. and we appreciate it. And if I can read the council's mind, I think the question to be is, do we have this available? Yeah, just <laughs> the answer is yes. So Anita and I have been spending some time with the LMI. Our LMI fund is actually in a good position right now. However, uh, yeah, good position to do the 30000 for the next three years, as well as do some of the projects with the housing that are coming up as well. So we budget all those and we can fit this in there and so that that is a piece that is available if you so choose to decide to move with that forward well, i'd like to make that oh so oh. <laughs> given that i think mr shimmers is going to say what i was going to say i was going to second uh council member alice's first oh. <laughs> I, I would like to say that we move this forward for a three years with a thirty thousand uh, dollar attachment to it Yeah, the motion. We in Bill second. Yep. Okay. Oh, I didn't hear the second. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> he did it before she exited. Oh, you can second before the. It motion? was kind of different, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so we. He's reading my mind. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second uh, for the three-year contract at thirty thousand. Is there any other discussion on this? I just would like to um, thank you for your work, and I just um, if you could just talk a little bit more though about some of the partner agencies that you do work with um, I'm sorry, can you repeat some the of the partner agencies that you work with uh, so far since I since I've been in this position community action information referral the County Board of Supervisors um, United Way oh my goodness I think we had a s ASAC ASAC there Mm -hmm. ASAC and we are we're we're tightening that connection a little bit so we've been trying to really hone in on some of the more distant relationships and kind of bring them in a little tighter too so ASAC is one of those that we've been giving a little additional attention to so so just out of curiosity if we don't have the housing available now and the people that are basically squatting mm -hmm. they're going to be looking for low-income housing as well where will these people end up going do you want me to answer that honestly under the bridge well, no, honestly, what will happen is, of course, some of them will will choose to stay outside in the warmer climate uh, because some of them do choose that, Yeah. They, though it's not the lifestyle you and I would choose. It is the lifestyle that some choose. Okay. But uh, ultimately what happens is that there's typically enough turnaround that they are what we call hoppers. So oh. they stay in a unit as long as they can, then they will start the eviction process. They will usually opt to leave before they get evicted so they they voluntarily will pack up their belongings and then they go to the next residence well then that unit is open so somebody else can get into it you know so there's a lot there's typically more hopping around and so yeah. though we don't really realize how much movement there is they're always shuffling which is allowing more openings and it's it's sad because they're never able to put their roots down anywhere or have any stability but because they're not hopping at the moment, 
you can look at it, I guess, that they are staying a little bit stable because they're going to the same place all the time. But what they're causing is instability for the landlords. And they're pushing other people out from having the ability to become hoppers. And ideally, we're working more in the homeless prevention side of things so that mm -hmm. we're keeping them in a place when it doesn't get to the extreme. But we're in an extreme time where it's not the... You know, they're not allowed, like Angie takes pride in providing case management to individuals and working with them through issues. They're not having time to do that right now. So um, it is mm -hmm. it is a Band-Aid right now, and it's an emergency <coughs> right now. Um, and do and people hopefully with... Hopefully once we get through it, we can get to where we're working more of uh, proactively yeah. addressing um, and solving the problem. Do so. people with children take a front seat? They do not. Okay. I was... So what we're currently working on is a new uh, prioritization assessment tool. We don't get a choice in the assessment tool that we're given. HUD mandates what we have to use. Okay. Uh, but I just joined the assessment tool committee because I don't, I don't agree with things like that. So we, we are all working together to make a better assessment tool so we can send it to HUD and ask for approval. Now, whether they'll approve or not we, it remains to be seen. But we're working on it because we recognize things like that. Sure. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, is that we're also working to build relationships with landlords um, so that maybe if they have an extra unit or they're willing to invest in our program, we will have more units available. So that's also been something that I've tried to devote some time to <coughs> is building the relationship with the landlords so that they're more willing to work with the program and we have more units available. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Okay. It actually Thank leads you. to our next topic after this one's done. Go ahead, Council Just, just <laughs> one <laughs> quick yeah. um, Obviously, this is not <clears throat> just for the city. Right. And there are the, no boundaries. It goes beyond the boundaries. And I know you mentioned the county comes into play. Yes. Um, it's a big county. If people wanted to participate and help in other county or other parts of the county, other cities, who would they call? This is an opportunity for you to give a, a phone number out because we have media listening in. <laughs> And, I, and I'd like to see and, and encourage other cities to help any way they can through either housing or money or, or uh, maybe even volunteering. If somebody from another city or jurisdiction is wanting to roll up their sleeves and help, they can call me directly or Shannon. And I'll share my personal cell phone number for them. If it's a client, they need to call the hotline. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, so we, I, I'm happy to have those conversations. And the county is a, is a great supporter of ours, as well as the city's, you know, Comanche and DeWitt. And um, we do, a, do a, plea, a yearly plea to all the cities and counties, because we do serve Clinton and Jackson counties. Um, but the dollars that we're talking to you about specifically today are right for the residents of Clinton, obviously. So I'm on the homeless committee that the sisters have with Lori Freudenberg and... Uh, we do have help from Davenport and some of the Jackson counties. I mean, they're involved. Yeah. They can't do much more than we can do. They're doing their best they can to service themselves. But they do come up to these meetings and offer advice or um, they have lobbyists. Um, now, now's the time to have a lobbyist if you're having real problems is, is the time during the legislative period to do this. So. Um, it's tough. I mean, you sit and you listen to this. I've been on this committee, I think, four or five years, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to get something going where you can stabilize people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do have a meeting with Lori on Friday because we one of the things that we you know, um, need is emergency shelter. Yeah. We used to be an emergency shelter for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in the state of Iowa. decided they wanted to do things differently. Regionalization. And I hold the only only hang up on it was that some were smoking in their rooms, so they had to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just a hotel. All of us stayed at a hotel together. We probably would have. Standing individuals. So. 
Are they paying the hotel motel tax? Manager. That's my no. Yes. <laughs> There's no case manager at the hotel, even though it's acting as non-congregate shelter. And we, we did make a plea to FEMA, just so that you're all aware of that, to try to help us with non-congregate sheltering. And so far, we have not gotten a response other than um, our plea for a case manager to be present during four hours of the workday. Uh, it was denied at this time. So we have sent an appeal. Uh, we're not giving up. We're going to continue to push forward and beg FEMA to reconsider, but um, our initial plea for a case manager for four hours per day at the hotel to help those that are in a most, the most need, they're the ones that are leaving the most volatile situations, they, FEMA denied. So. I actually had a meeting the other day with someone from Riverview Center. Have you heard of them? Yes. Uh, and I, I hopefully, I sent them your way to, mm -hmm. I think he, they work on, on some of those different items as well. Um, his name was Jed Spidwell, I believe. He's new to that organization. So um, you might get a call from him. Um, I don't okay. know how they work or how they operate, but I thought that you guys would be a good stop for them to try to help if they can, too. So. Sure. And we are working with all the different community partners yeah. to figure yeah. out if there's some, you know, behind the sky <laughs> solution here that we could make a reality. Um, yeah. There's 32 families at Econo Lodge, an emergency shelter right now. At fifty dollars a day, so it's a pretty hefty bill at the moment. So, just to give you an idea, um, and it's probably not to handle, not enough to handle for the hotel owner either. When you Actually, think about it, no, they're taking a reduction in rate. Yeah, we're some. putting out as many fires as we can, but when you can't, I mean, it it works. It's a very nice program, but in the other, you've got a backside to it also. Mm -hmm. Yep, they need services, and we we just can't we just can't afford to be out there without reimbursement for the case manager. So, we're doing what we can via phone and trying to keep our interactions, yeah. you know, predictable. Trying to work with the staff, but they're getting tired. They've been they've been doing this for us since October, mm -hmm. so they're they're getting tired. And there's not there's not going to be a um, they're not going to lift the mandate on non congregate shelter at least until the end of 2021. So it's it's something that we have to continue to work with. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much, both Thank of you. Thank you. Time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You need a roll call, Your Honor. Oh yes. Uh, I guess I'll go one last uh, chance for discussion. All right. Can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Allison. Yes. Seeley. Yes. Connell. Yes. Shemmers. Yes. Oprin. Yes. Mustman. Yes. Kearns. Yes. All right. Uh, do we have a uh, Mr. Henderson online? Bryce. Yeah, I'm here. All right. We can hear you. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you for being here tonight.
Um, with that comes a lot of extra paperwork um, and frankly a lot of extra costs to make sure that we're doing a historically accurate renovation of the building, making sure we're retaining a lot of the historic fabric. Um, you don't really notice it much on the upper floors, but on the first floor the goal will be to um, really bring it back to more of a restaurant banquet space, um, open up the skylights, and the uh, ornate ceiling is in still in pretty good shape. So we'll obviously bring all of that back here um, and uh, bring some additional retail and amenity space to the first floor. Uh, just, you know, obviously the amenity space is, is intended for our residents um, and then the commercial retail will help bring some additional vibrancy to downtown. Uh, what, where we've kind of come to at this point is, is uh, you know, my background, I'm actually a CPA. I was a senior tax manager with Deloitte, so uh, I'm the number cruncher. Um, well, what we've done up to this point is we've kind of, we've plugged in our costs. We've plugged in based on um, some market comps of what we think we can get for rent for the apartments as well as rent for the commercial spaces. Uh, kind of backed into what we can get from a, a loan, um, figured in a price for uh, bringing in an investor for the federal and the Iowa historic tax credits, and uh, simply run it through the machine. And it, what it spit out was we had a project that, um, while we think is great for downtown Clinton, um, needs some help. And so I spoke with Matt uh, Brooke initially and just kind of walked him through you know, what I think our ask is and, um, you know, even started, you know, brainstorming some ways where we can help close that gap in pretty large chunks. Um, but he kind of said the next first step was to present um, some of our initial findings. Obviously, as we get further down the road, um, we'll have much more refined drawings and much more detail on the construction budget. Um, but this is more of just getting in front of you folks presenting a little bit of what we've got planned, presenting uh, kind of the issue we have, um, and then I guess maybe granting Matt some authority to continue to work with us on finding some solutions. In general, the ask um, would be, uh, you know, call it a 20-year pay-as-you-go tip or tax abatement on a property, and, um, you know, the ask is, frankly, $2 million worth of incentives um, now, I don't necessarily anticipate that's all coming from the city. I, I think when Matt and I talked about it, you know, an easy answer would be the federal government is, as part of the new bill that they're pushing through on all the PPP and the COVID uh, response, is there is a provision that bumps the federal tax credit from 30%, from 20% to 30%. If that got passed, that would bring uh, close to a million dollars more to the project and cuts that, you know, that deficit in half. Um, there's also, we're not currently budgeting for any brownfield uh, in, uh, incentive or support from the state um, just because they've kind of shut that program down as a rate of late. Um, I know um, you guys uh, worked to help get a facade grant for the Wilson building. That would be another option. Um, and then beyond that, I think I'm, I, at this point, I'm, uh, I talked to Matt. He seems eager to yeah, roll up the sleeves and work with me to help get creative to find a way to fill that gap. Um, but obviously we want to have your guys' guidance and support before we do. And at this point, I've, I've rambled for an awful long time and it's quiet, so I'm going uh, <laughs> to let anyone and everyone ask me any questions about Bush, about myself, my background, about the building. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Councilman Connell here. Uh, what kind of I guess uh, split between market rate, are you looking at some LMI aspect or primarily stay with the market rate? Uh, primarily we're looking at market rate. Um, obviously we've got some units in there on, um, they're, they're pretty efficiently sized. So if that was something that we need to look at, we could probably look at the, what the LMI is in Clinton. Um, obviously based on the conversation that uh, preceded me, Sounds like there's a need for some efficient and, uh, you know, uh, housing, housing for folks that is not on a necessarily a high end. So, as you can see, we've got a lot of decently smaller size. So a lot of the studios and one bedrooms are not big units. Um, they're trying to be efficient, but we usually do that with our our design anyway. 
because um, generally we find people are looking and they've got a budget of X amount of dollars and they're not necessarily looking for a huge apartment or a certain square footage, they're more looking for, to see myself living here and I think we can just deliver some pretty efficient units and um, if that ends up being something that we need to talk about as a, a clause to help uh, provide additional support for, from the city, I think we can certainly look into that. I'm not ex expressing interest in that right now. I'm just asking if you guys have already crossed that bridge, really, is, yeah, is kind of my concern. Full rate. Um, okay. We have talked to a, we don't do a whole lot of um, LIHTC development. Um, we did talk to one other developer that we know is in the state um, and didn't necessarily know if this project was a great fit for it. Um, so we we have at least put our foot on the bridge, but we really haven't gotten much further than Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Cody. Will you be uh, closing on the building, or are you getting all your ducks in a row before you actually go through with the actual purchase? Uh, we're planning uh, to have uh, maybe not all my ducks, but most of them in a row before we acquire. So the building's under contract. Our due diligence period still runs for another 45, 60 days. We have some ability to extend it as well. Okay. So uh, the nice thing is, is from a ducks in a row perspective, uh, financing is in a good position. I have investors lined up for the tax credits. Um, I, the historian's already done a lot of her homework and feels the building's a strong candidate, so that helps solve a lot of the problems. So now we're just really down to getting a temperature for what, if any, assistance we can expect from the city uh, to help fill this gap before mm -hmm. we make a decision on moving forward with acquisition or looking to either drag it out or Okay. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. And I, I think that's a good path for, uh, you know, obviously we don't know what it's going to be exactly, but Mac can start working on it and bring it back to us and we'll see what happens. Yeah, because our, our biggest thing when, we, when Bryce and I talked is, you know, it's one of those things, do we let a building go not sold and then it sits there for even longer, becomes more of a nuisance, and then it falls in the city's hands to then figure out what mm -hmm. to do with it. So we're, we're looking at the whole bandwidth area, and we, we did include looking at LMI, but also fishing rate and also market rate. And the reason we do that is, is because we have to make sure we uncover every stone. And you've got to remember, too, is even if it were to go that way, if you think about Roosevelt, they're switching from some of their LMIs to market right now, right? Mm -hmm. So I just look at it as this is, this is, you know, and Bryce is being humble, but Bush guys are getting ready to work on the Wilson building as well, and they do great work. Uh, this would be another great thing. I was looking at, actually, just a small digression. If you look at the 15 most traveled to cities in Iowa, besides having a Danish windmill, most of them have a very ornate, very neat, either a hotel or apartment complex that's been redone. You know, and why do they go there? I don't know. They go for the tulips, the pillow, right? Mm -hmm. So when you come across a bridge, what's the first thing you see after you see the salvage yard? Well, you see Lafayette, right? And we'd rather have the first thing you see is Lafayette. Yeah, I'm always looking at the chamber. <laughs> well, and that's that's pretty cool. And they were done by another <laughs> Yeah, and and like Bryce said, this is a, a historical piece in in the downtown, and it'd be a shame. I mean, it's been sitting probably, you know, besides being empty, but it's been sitting with nothing done to it far too long. And it seems like once they're empty, they just like it's turn right. into pudding, yeah. you know. And so no, yeah, this is. That. Lots of pudding. So, yeah, it's definitely part of that budget is uh, really it just needs a lot of uh, TLC. And I guess, um, as Matt pointed out, we've done this before. If you're looking for a, kind of an example of what we can do, um, if you look up the Hershey Loft in Muscatine. Yeah. Recently, yeah. Very uh, nice. We just completed in December of 19. Um, that was 25 market rate apartments with first floor commercial retail. Uh, our prop, we're now, uh, we've got 24 out of 25 units that are leased, and 85% of the commercial retail is leased. And uh, again, took a, a building that was probably in better shape than this one, but a vacant building in the heart of downtown Muscatine and brought it back to life. And <clears throat> as far as I can tell, everybody downtown is pretty grateful that we did it. So our, our hope is to be able to do something like that for the city of Clinton, because uh, you guys got a lot of great things going for you. Um, but one of the things you probably don't really have, as far as I can tell, is this kind of adaptive reuse housing 
Um, and you know, again, between Wilson and this building, that'll that kind of proves everybody that can get done. And mm -hmm. usually, what happens then is all the other real estate gets gobbled up, and everybody else kind of follows suit. But you've got to have those one or two uh, pioneers to help show that they can get done and prove that the market exists. And mm -hmm. then it, you just see all the exponential growth after that. We've just been waiting on Yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, I, I, I think, well, I'm speaking for myself, but I think I speak for others that we appreciate you working on this. And I'd like to make a motion to direct Matt to uh, work with Bryce and see what we can come up with. I'll second that. I'll third it. <laughs> third it? Okay, we have a motion, a second, and a third. Is there any other discussion? Bryce, we appreciate your time and, and look forward to working with you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be up in town before you know it, and uh, we'll be uh, making nuisance of myself and hopefully I get a chance to meet most, most of you folks and do this in person pretty soon. Definitely. Make Thank it a you. Tuesday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there any other discussion on this? Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Allison. Yes. Seely. Yes. Connell. Yes. Shemmers. Yes. Obrin. Yes. Musman. Yes. Burns. Yes. Thanks again, Bryce. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much. Have a great night, everybody. Thank thanks you. Too. Thanks, Bryce. Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> We're gonna punt Josh to the end. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. Mayor sir. Council, Josh Eggers, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, I feel like this is a Shark Tank opportunity because what I'm bringing to you, hopefully, you will view. <laughs> as an opportunity. Does that make me Mr. Wonderful? It could be. It could be. I got the, I got the bald head. I got the bald head, so who, who, so who knows? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so I, I've got a two-part presentation. Uh, the, the first one here is, is, is the fund balance that currently uh, is sitting in the council report. Um, with enough to cover this project. So that's the dollars that I would be seeking. So what I'm looking for tonight is to try to uh, pitch this project to you, an investment into our marina um, with, with fu a funding source that is already intact. So we're not asking to borrow taxpayer dollars. So I think that's the, the, one of the bigger selling points of this. Um, our BDOC currently has a, a waiting list uh, of over 20 boats for covered slips for 40 foot. Um, right now we've got eight slips in between the two sets of covered blues, as you'll see on the screen, uh, that we are proposing that we, that we do cover at this time. Uh, the plan would be to take the people on the waiting list, the first eight in, put them in the, the new covered slips, and then relocate the existing eight boaters uh, to another section of the marina that is uncovered, so they're getting a like-for-like like slip. Uh, we talked about this first at the Marina Recommendations Committee. Um, we've got a very good support group there, and then we brought this to our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and they voted unanim unanimously to bring this forward to you guys uh, to hopefully vote to spend this funding, uh, the spending authority to do this project. Um, the second uh, part to this would be to do modifications to our CDOC. If you can uh, see right there where that floating deck is that sits right out front of the candlelight, um, it's got one point of egress right now. The plan would be to move that on the north side of the existing gangplank that it's uh, connected to and then take the existing slips that you'll see just below it and then connect it with more slips to the gas dock. So ultimately, you would have the gangplank right in front of the candlelight and you'd have a walkway from the gas dock, um, which, would, which would give us the ability to add at least four new slips of the 20-foot to 25-foot variety of which we also have a waiting list for. I think currently we have a waiting list of at least seven slip renters for, uh, for, for 20 foot slips and over 20 for 25 foot slips. So we've got waiting lists right now. So if we put these slips in, these slips would fill automatically. Um, by doing so, it takes the party deck, if you will, a little further away from the candlelight. So any live entertainment we would put on that does not disrupt the candlelight restaurant goers. I think that was a concern that candlelight originally thought about is if there was music, would it keep the, the people that go to the restaurant to stay longer and maybe, maybe, maybe buy more alcohol, but not as much food where I think their top sales come from? So that was one concern they had. This helps alleviate that. Um, so that's something we're proposing tonight is to take that fund balance to make those modifications. Another piece to that puzzle would be the gas dock itself. Um, we've got our marina staffed underneath the Candlelight Restaurant, which is about 75 yards from the marina itself. And I think if, as, as some of you are boaters, will understand when you've got a car or a van parked in one of the handicapped stalls at the restaurant, you can't see down to the gas dock. We're dependent upon making a call to the marina staff. Hopefully they're by the phone so then they can make the trek down there to finally pump the gas. Some boaters may say, screw it, I don't see anybody, I'm just, I'm just going to leave. Um, 
what I think this would give us the opportunity to do is build its own little platform. We've already got our point of sales down there for fuel right now. So we'd be able to move our marina shop as well um, to put it right there on the water. So now when a boat pulls up, they've got direct access to these, to these boaters, which I think is important. So uh, really the nuts and bolts of what we're pitching is to cover the remaining eight uncovered BDOC slips, move the floating deck to connect to the existing 20-foot slips, connect that to the gas dock, which creates us four more slips, and then at the very top of the sea dock there, Matt, if you could, uh, extending um, at least two more fingers to the per uh, perpendicular to the sea dock to add four more docks there, uh, four more slips there, if you will. So that would be an additional eight 20 to 25 foot slips, again, which we all have waiting lists for. Um, Miko Sullivan helped put this design together for us. I believe they're the ones that fabricated the docks in the first place. They put an estimated price tag on this of, of about $265,000, <coughs> which if you remember, council just approved uh, phase one to do the ADOC repairs. Uh, so this would be the second part to that puzzle. Um, one thing to point out is that uh, price tag could have changed because this was all during COVID. I think we've all understood that material prices are now significantly higher than they were. So really what we're looking for tonight would be a motion to approve spending authority for the Parks and Recreation Department to uh, pursue this. And what we would do then from there is refine these drawings, uh, sit down with our Marina Recommendations Committee and find out how many of which slips do we really want. Do we want to target 420 and 425 foot slips? Um, but that would obviously be contingent upon your guys' appetite for this project tonight. So jet skis right potentially jet skis, absolutely. Um, but also with the 20, yeah, it does, that. absolutely. And ultimately with pushing this dock closer to the gas dock, we may take the four closest slips to the gas dock and make them transients. So when people want access to our gas dock, they'll have the ability to pull up and then we would just take four of the existing transients and put those up for sale in the actual sea dock marina itself. How does this affect the fire fireboat so we we have met on this with preliminary discussions and i think we're going to talk to our parks advisory board tomorrow about what options there could be uh we we have looked at a few locations um we've not landed on anything because of clearly we want the aesthetics of the marina to be intact um, but we're looking at possibly replacement where the floating deck is now as an option perhaps closer down to where the, uh, the american queen and the american duchess dock as an opportunity and then possibly to the south end of the sea dock itself so there's just there's more things to work through with that, but we have had that preliminary discussion. Um, some of that will be dependent upon whether or not the grant um, can go through for the uh, what, what's the grant, Joel? Uh, port security the, grant. the port security grant that I think there's been multiple attempts made to, and then possibly a CCDA grant. So, you see, you say that? the area north of the gas dock was going to be considered, or no? Uh, not at this time. At this time, that was something that was previously looked at, but I don't think it was an ideal scenario for the fire department, from my understanding, without speaking with them. You got boats coming there to get to fuel up. There's no room for that on the north side there. I believe that was a consideration, yeah. yes. Um, and the other thing with uh, going to the further to the south would be ideal, but it will cost more money to run the gangplank and the, and the water lines and the electrical lines. Um, and also getting to those, you've got all the other boats. If a boat catches on fire, now they got to try to get all the way to their boat. That could be a hindrance as well. So that piece has definitely go been right there. looked at. We yeah. want to take it to the other committees right first before we circle back to you guys. I was just thinking just for exactly. you know, emergency access, you want yeah. something close, not down by where, like, Correct. say, the American Queen would come. You want your guys to get down to the boat yeah. as quick where as Where Matt's can. circling right now is, like, ideal right at the end of that. <laughs> yes, sir. So basically, we want to be away from the other boats. So if there's an accident on with a boat, an accident fueling a boat, which we've had in the past. Oh, where's he at? Yeah, he, <laughs> and, uh, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, we're looking at, and Matt, if you can go farther to the south. Yeah. So we see where that concrete comes out there mm -hmm. and come out and put something out there so we're away from everybody and then maybe put a dock when the uh, Mississippi Queen or some other boats come in, they can land. That's preliminary, but... There's an opportunity there. We're away from everybody. We can park up on Riverfront Drive and get right down to the to the boat. That's not a bad spot either. Huh. Have to increase your maintenance dredging budget. I'm sorry. So you got to increase your maintenance dredging budget. Yeah. Correct. Isn't there? Oh. Oh. We're not even that far yet to even start talking about that. Again, the next process, Josh has a couple of committees and then apply, wait for the Homeland Security grant to open up again and apply for that <laughs> to help with some of the funding. Okay. Isn't there some vacated utilities and stuff at that location for when when the bell was there? 
There's, there's the water lines. Yeah, there's water there. I'm not sure exactly how they terminate electricity there. But, but, uh, you know, where the, you know, just south of the kiosk there, that's where all the bell was serviced from. Yes. So that potentially going that far south might be, you know, in a big picture, the most optimum place to be. Well, if you remember, we just modified that landing zone for the Queen. We had that kind of yes. pier to nowhere that wasn't going to work for them and mm -hmm. modified into that. And and there was um, utilities discussed. I think Bob had mentioned once before yeah. there was a, um, a discharge mm -hmm. section just south of that, I thought. But certain, certainly, the, you know, I, th I think the idea of um, making this a broader project to include, you know, the mm -hmm. fireboat, and that, you know, makes a lot more sense in the long run. Yep. I, I think agree. it was a public safety boat, wasn't it? Safety. Wasn't that what it was called? Yes. Oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. Public safety boat. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, if I can, too, I, th I think to Sean's point, too, about the maintenance dredging, that, that's the great thing about this fund is this has the ability to regenerate itself. So this isn't something that we have to come back to council and hopefully ask for tax dollars to be spent on this because when you get your gross sales from the candlelight restaurant or their rent, like that, that helps rebuild this every year to the tune of about 100 to 110,000, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Anita, typically annually. So as we, as we take this down to make marina improvements, which is, makes complete sense, this will have the ability to build back up. So in three or four years when we need to dredge, maybe we say, hey, what's in the fund balance? And we start there so we're not coming and asking for CIP dollars to do that. So, yeah. Um, the additional slips will generate revenue too. Money. I mean, you need to make sure you have money for the dredging and mm -hmm. for maintenance because, you know, tax dollars, you know, it's like, I understand this is a city amenity, but mm -hmm. also it's kind of a quasi type situation where it should be supporting itself. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the budget estimate for it, the, the beginning marina balance was 621000 with phase phase one and phase two combined, it still leaves you with about three hundred and thirteen thousand after after you take these pieces out. So it's still pretty healthy, and there's no plans right now to dip into that any further at this time, other than maybe future you know uh, HVAC for the marine, uh, for the candlelight restaurant itself, perhaps dredging down the road for three or four years, and it will build its way back up. So I think what this is, is a good opportunity. The space that you're using right now. Opportunity opportunity for what we don't know yet but getting out of that space i think will open it up for other business opportunities i know there's there's been some conversation about pop perhaps like a bar grill type restaurant to go downstairs that we would obviously work with the candlelight as the good neighbors that we are I just to make sure that we wouldn't go do correct correct absolutely and we've actually had conversations matt yeah. and i have and sat down with them and kind of let them know that our intent would be to kind of appeal to the river side of things um, a little bit more with the, you know, t-shirt cutoff kind of group that, you know, some of us are, myself included. Um, but he, he was seriously yeah. looking at it, but at the same time, he ended up opening another store. This is before COVID. Sure. Uh, another restaurant. But he was seriously looking at actually having a uh, downstairs location where folks could be at the bar with their little buzzer, have a little more elbow room, but you could still order a burger and stay down, come off the river and go back, or you could I, be downstairs and then go up too. So. Yeah, I would, I would think being partners with candlelight and yep. something like that would be yeah. would be cool it'd be like yeah. a first right of refusal type of conversation probably because we, we, we want just want to make sure that they're not Correct. we don't tick them off absolutely they're they're a good partner and we want to keep them around so. well and those six percent of sales really help fund this or yeah fund this Correct. this, this balance yeah. that we have so of course that we would want to take that into consideration so um <coughs> I, I think before any motions I, I do have the second part of uh, uh to this would be alcohol sales now uh, I, I don't want you to take that too scarily. Um, beer sales is something that's very common on the river. If you go north and south of us, every marina pretty much sells beer except for Clinton Marina. So typically when you come to our marina, you have the ability to get gas and ice and you have to walk up to our uh, store to get you know, your apparel. Moving this facility down closer to the water, allowing me to proceed with alcohol sales for packaged alcohol, which we've reached out to our city attorney, we've reached out to ICAP uh, with, Julie, with Julie Bray, uh, got their endorsements, as far as being able to do this, now it's just a matter of does the council want to support that. So the reason we're bringing it to you guys today would be to approve my ability as the Parks and Recreation Director to be the name on the application. We will apply as a city. Um, that's where the liability would be, but you have to have to get to the next steps, somebody from the city with their name, social security number to actually be on the application itself. So 
Um, I think it makes sense as the director to be that person, but ultimately it would be the city applying for the license in the end. But be the mayor there? that was that was a recommendation from from I think your your partner at, at your firm I believe might have made that recommendation. Well, well I, I think that was just one option. Right. I know. I would. Yeah, but. But, I th I, but what we thought was... In Whose word does it fall? So you're really, telling me I'll have a we really, license then? <laughs> <laughs> we really felt that someone reputable was the right choice. Yeah. Oh, so they... <laughs> so, so Kathy was going to be here. No. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I do think we're missing a significant opportunity with our alcohol sales. So... I did put some dollar amounts in there of what I think we could do just with slips alone, but I mean that's that's just with the slip rentals. You're you're now talking the fuel sales that these extra boats will have if we can work these transients closer to the gas dock. The residual effect that now the restaurant goers it'll be a lot more easier for them to do. If we could put entertainment on that floating deck, uh, you know maybe have some hot dogs and they can go grab a bite to eat and just sit on the floating deck and really enjoy that space. I think we will maximize the opportunity that's ahead of us right now. And again, I, I hate to reiterate, but not using tax dollars. I think that is the biggest selling point of this project right now with the ability to refund the further we go years down the road. So 75% of it bush light. Uh, a lot will be bush light, yes. I'd like to make a motion to push that forward. Okay. I'll second. And that would be for both the project and the alcohol sales permit. Okay. Let's talk timeline. So timeline would be, that, and that's why I brought this now, because <coughs> working with Miko Sullivan, just to get preliminary, pre preliminary ideas, they said they're about a four-month build out. So we would obviously bid this project out, but we just kind of went with them because they built these original docks. So we would want to probably bid this April, May, so that the build can be happening all summer, that we could do a fall install once we hit October so that we're ready for the, for the boating season, or at least substantial completion by spring of 2022 would be the goal. But that, you're going to come back to us with more solid concrete. Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. We've got preliminary drawings, which I shared with you today, drawn by them, but we'll go back and we'll do a refinement of that and say, this is the final product, and then we would do a bid hearing where you guys would then have the ability to approve the project with the final specs to go out to bid, so. Hold on, one, one second, Ms. Okay. Council Member Musman. Um, the engineer probably would be either Miko Sullivan with a combination of Jason or really could be. I don't like that idea. Okay. Okay. Open to suggestions. Interesting. We, well, the great news is we're not building an arc. We're basically adding on to already current infrastructure, so it shouldn't be rocket science, but sure. I mean, at the same time we can address. Do you need, you need an right. engineer that's specific. Yeah, in this I mean, range, it depends I on how you're going to go about bidding the whole project out. I mean, there's some, there's some, oddities to to cover in those and wait and Miko Sullivan's got the that information but I think I don't I'm not so sure that Ali didn't look or maybe wasn't Ali at the time but didn't look at some of that stuff you know what that, that's, to, that but, is something we could yeah. definitely do and the only reason we've been working with Miko Sullivan is because they came to town and I think they they built these originally and they said that they would be willing to help refine these drawings at no cost no additional cost so if we can get the drawings used on like for like materials and then bid it out open that part up to everybody i think that'd be a fair shake for everybody yeah. to have a chance to at least bid it um, but as far as running this through ali i would have no problems you know getting his blessing on that he's he's been very good for us in the past does that help answer your question mm -hmm. or concerns all right we're going to go to council member must online yeah, I have a question, <clears throat> depends on how much you buy <laughs> how much you so drink. i i can only answer part Do you want me to comment on that? Yes, please. Well, I, I, our real concern, and ICAP had the same thought, is that if we were serving like we like a bar and we had people coming up over and over again, right, there's much more exposure from that. If we're selling alcohol that's we don't have anything to do with it other than handing over the closed alcohol, to ser you know, we're not serving, we're not pouring draft beer. We're selling them beer chilled or whatever mm -hmm. you know but it's coming from the dis the distributor and that we're selling it and so we're not making those decisions 
for them. You know, um, the police, you know, DNR, people like that. They, you know, they, if they see you violating the, the rules while you're out boating, they're going to come after you. They're going to ticket you for OWI or whatever. Um, but, you know, we still need to watch and pay attention, but it's it's much less exposure than if we're we have an open bar, which this will not be that case. So, yeah, I mean, Councilmember Musman raises is a good point. Anytime you're serving alcohol, you have to be responsible. You have to follow the law. You have to make sure we don't. The main issue is we don't want to sell to any underage people. Right. And we're going to have measures in place for that. We've discussed all that. That's the main thing that I see as the main worry. And I think Josh has got a plan for that. We're going to have people that are trained that know, you know, hey, you got to check IDs. The IDs have to be legitimate. We have ways of knowing that. So... If we're going to do it, we have to do it right, and right. and that's the goal is to do it right so that we limit our exposure. And a lot of that comes down to the tips training, too, that's available to our staff. And I think to serve package alcohol, to put you at ease, if, if this helps, I think you only have to be 16 to do that. And we may say we want to be more stringent on our own protocols than 16, but that's how they view it. If you can have a 16-year-old sell, selling packaged alcohol, then they're, they're pretty comfortable with your, your ability to do so. Um, now, whether we make it 17 or 18 ourselves, I mean, you know, we could always, you know, go more I don't, strict. I don't that. think us selling it would be any different than high V, right? Correct. No, that's correct. correct. I mean, all right, Councilmember Oberyn, go ahead. Is there a way that this can be phased so that we get that? Um, I don't want to call it a canteen, but to get the canteen down on the water mm -hmm. sooner. You know, because that's that's where our that's where our our uh, um, revenue is going to be coming from, Correct. and and that's a, a to me that's almost like a smaller piece than you know trying to figure out all the other right you know forty foot twenty five foot. You're going to see pretty significant revenue from the covered slips though too. Agreed, because they jump up quite a bit once you're covered. Yeah, and, and again, I can't speak for the fabrication side of it and how long something like that would take because. Because, again, you know, they, they'll have to measure out the floats and make sure the support. One thing we've got to get them is what will we all put in that shack? I, I say shack loosely, but because um, we're going to have our point of sales in there. We're going to have, you know, coolers, ice chests, beer coolers. We talked about potentially putting a live bait well down there to sell live bait to all the boaters that go out there. So once we get them those uh, dimensions and weights, they'll be able to say, hey, you need a structure that can support this. Then they'll, you know, help us uh, put together what that would look like. But the good thing about this is this isn't a capital improvement re request. These are dollars that are available now. So if the council approves them, we can do, we can move as quickly as we want to mm -hmm. on it. Um, I was just trying to be cautious of the time to fabricate uh, the docks themselves and, uh, you know, getting the public hearing set to, to go out for bid on this. The issue with that, um, when you're dealing with this river work, you're talking to mobilization for equipment, you got to sink piles. Mm -hmm. So it would be great to get that going right away. But if you're going to mobilize... A small barge and sink piles for something like that True. you're going to want to sink every one of them every while they're there or you're talking 15 to 30 grand just to mobilize absolutely somebody maybe out of dubuque or somebody out of you know the quad cities just to get them here i think you're spot on with that estimate too we did reach out to dubuque uh, i think newt marine, newt marine just to kind of get some mm -hmm. preliminary ideas of how much does it cost to drive a piling the good news is we're using a lot of existing docks and we may be just moving some pilings and i think to reuse a piling as opposed to drilling new is, is half the cost so we will need some new pilings because we're adding fingers, but if we can reuse what we have, that'll save substantial dollars. So, Councilmember Shemmers. Yeah, my point of clarification for the record was to, yes, it would be, my motion was for both phase one and phase two. Okay. I don't know if Lisa caught that or not. Phase one has been approved. Phase one's approved. Okay. That was the yep. ADOC improvements, so this would be phase this, two and then the uh, phase alcohol two and sales. The alcohol. Yes. Permit application. There you go. Yep. Thank you for okay. clarifying clarifying my clarification no thank you for your right. motion <laughs> so we we have a motion and a second councilmember muffson you have you have something else i was going to say don't forget coffee sales coffee sales correct okay we have a motion and a second pre prepackaged coffee we have, a, <laughs> we have a motion and a second for phase two and then also to pursue the the alcohol sales side of things is there any other discussion from the council on this What is my budget? <laughs> well, it looks like 265. <laughs> I think you want to be 50% of the project. That, include, that includes mobilization and install in their budget? Yep. Okay. Yep. Nice. 
That was a combination of Miko's uh, layouts that they presented and Newt's. Oh, okay. Um, so you, it's a combination with Newt. Yeah, the total Because Miko doesn't install, it doesn't install. They sell. No, correct. And what will happen is probably either local or nearby fabricators will probably contract with a Newt or vice versa or some combination of it, I would imagine. Because some of the fabricators may not do piling. Some of the piling companies may not do fabrication. So they'll probably bid it together. That, that would be my, my estimation. I know we talked about this, the, the finishing the gutters. Is, was that in phase yeah, one, or is we'll, that something we're else we're trying to do out of our operating budget this spring? Perfect. And I've got some things in the, in the works on that. Okay. I will. I will tell you that if that's where you're going with with these improvements, you might want to really look at the the bird issue that we've had up there. That it's well, an ongoing thing, and you could probably talk to those guys about it tomorrow. I agree. Well, no, the the problem is the problem is that we need the downspouts to go all the way down to the bottom, because and, now. The water goes into the gutters, and goes into the downspout, and then blows straight on the boats. Correct. I, I look at it as let no good deed go unpunished. <laughs> yeah. You when know we, what? When we took over marina management, that was the one complaint that we thought we could tackle was the was the birds. So we, we tried this. We had a meeting with the hawk guy. Yeah, I, know, I was the there with you. Guy, the laser guy. That's what we need to be looking at. We had spinning reflectors <laughs> yes. that I saw and at Home Depot. I'm like, let's try it. Let's try gutters. It, and the gutters worked when it rained with no wind, but then you added wind and it blew right on the boats. Yeah, who knew <laughs> the gutters were going to do that? I mean, it, so... Yeah. I like all the birds down there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can, can we have roll call, please? <laughs> Thank you. Can we do roll call, please? House member Alice. Yes. Seely? Yes. Connell? Yes. Shemmer? Yes. Obrin? Yes. Mussman? Yes. Kern? Yes. <laughs> the man that has two jet skis and a boat would like. <laughs> <laughs> Can we move on to the next item here, Mr. Mr. Brooks? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Brooks. Brookies. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, first off, thanks to uh, Miss Julie, Mr. Greg, and Mr. Ron, along with uh, I don't know if Karen's still with us tonight. Uh, Karen and Rich J from BNS. Um, so, what we, we're doing tonight here is we would like to actually move forward on only a portion of an update of the Liberty Square Ordinance, just for the signs. Yeah. And then that way we're going to go. As you know, in the CIP, we have $35,000 for a study, which is for Welcome Center, Historic Center, you know, at Liberty Square. But I think that's what I'm going to come back to you is that's a Liberty Square study. Yeah. The team basically came together and said, you know, in order to, in order to do this right, it doesn't make sense. And Steve Leidinger, I don't know if he's online, but he was great help from Lynch Dallas. And it was really his words I'll use, but said, does it make sense to get this all done and have a study and then have to go change things in the ordinance? Mm -hmm. Because we had a lot of good brainstormings about brainstormings. Like, look, we even looked at Davenport, how, you know, on Brady, they have entryways mm -hmm. to their Liberty Square, so to speak, but they don't have it on the other road. Mm -hmm. And so we think at this point is to, to move this forward. And it, it is for her, but it's also for the, the ability to have the signs, which we think are fitting for along there. It fits in the scope of DOT. It fits in the scope for what we want to do. It will not hurt as we go back to do the full study and then incorporate everything in the full update of the Liberty Square overlay, um, or excuse me, the Liberty Square overlay slash the ordinance. And so we're looking tonight to move forward to focus on the update of only the paragraph signs. seven on the, the signs. signs. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so one of those pieces and parts was, you know, where does it sit based on the right of way? And we're saying we're hit that in a second. And that how wide is the sign? How big is the LED? No flashing. We talked about. I don't, I'm using all you guys' stuff. Sorry, that was on the crew <laughs> um, as we went through. But basically, as you can see, eight feet in width versus 25 square feet. We just said we're going to go with width. Uh, we basically said. The signs along interstate highways must adhere to Iowa Code Chapter 306B or C, as well as any other applicable state codes. When a conflict exists between state and local, the more stringent restrictions shall apply. And that will hold firm. That, you're going to see that comment a lot even once we get the study done and we come back because that's what we're going to stick on there. And then also the is silent on the matter. If it's silent, then it will be the city code shall prevail. Um, we also put in there, we basically said instead of monument signs being only six feet, we said basically 15 feet. And the reason being is, if you notice, the team as they're going through, if you have an SUV parked, you can't see the sign. And a lot of the places, especially on the north side of Comanche Avenue, actually have places that with the signs, because, and that's also why we brought them closer to the right-of-way, because when they're further back, cars parked, you can't see a sign at six foot. So we made it 15 feet. 
And then these are all basically from the right of way, because remember, the right of way is not at the curb. <laughs> the right of way has a ginormous sidewalk on the north side, and then it starts. So we said one foot from that, so it'll still be one foot really from the sidewalk, the, the width of there, so it'll fit right there uh, instead of in the middle of his parking lot for this example as well. And then we basically got rid of the fact that prohibited, we, we lined through electronic because we're saying yes to it. Um, we want to have the LED backlit because if you remember, the <coughs> signs were always lights shining onto a sign uh, for that, and then as well as the changeable graphics. And we're using, we're actually using the example at the uh, awesome car wash. They have a piece. We, our group talked about 10 to 12 seconds holding, then switching, holding, then switching. And that, you'll notice that's a similar with the uh, billboard behind High V right now by Street or Public Works. Oh, yeah. yep. It's about give or take, sometimes it's seven or eight, but typically it's supposed to be 10 to 12 seconds because you're not supposed to be distracted as right, you're right. driving, <laughs> supposedly. But I'm always looking at the sign going around a corner. <laughs> yes. Um, and then the other thing that Steve really helped us with is, because we do not know looms, we do not know LED. Lumens. So he went and found this, and we're going to use this, but the sign's brightness is there's actually a way you can measure it. So if somebody goes and gets a sign that's too bright, we can actually go and say, nope, you got to turn down your looms for that. So we went with 0.3 foot candle, I can barely say that, uh, over ambient lighting conditions when measured is the recommended what we're going to go with. Um, electronic messaging centers, changeable graphics shall be limited to three feet in height um, this way. And then the signs, changeable graphics at least 80 feet from intersections. So there's another piece when it comes to intersections that you have to adhere to but with the state code as well. Uh, and then we just we use basically not change more frequently than every 12 seconds. So it's not going to be like flashing at you. It's going to be like save 25% and then you drive by and then it can switch to something else. So that's really what we have for today with the fact that to, to move this forward only for the signs, but knowing that we're going to get do a study on all Liberty Square. Yep. I'll make a motion to move it forward. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Hey, jumped me there, but I, I was just going to quick right. ask just to make sure that this wouldn't necessarily we do the study and half of this stuff change, right? Oh yeah. So I just I, you know I know the, this is a piece of it, but, but the just, group when we talked is we don't think the sign piece will change because okay. we, we we pulled this from current. What we're concerned, not to digress on that, what we're concerned about with the study is they come back and say like you know you should look at five story buildings. You should okay. look at commercial here you should set them back against the north side and then have the entrances that's the part we think okay but yeah. we, we're pretty confident and that's why we that's kept it just to these that these will hold true okay Rock on. i blame it on all the good teams so my only question would <laughs> be um we got someone lined up to go talk to irv we we're gonna ask the mayor okay perfect oh the one yeah he had, he had yes. an issue with his yeah uh -huh. yeah yep. yeah this started on the zoning board of adjustments and yes I said, yeah, let's just give them the variance, and the rest of them said, no, it's against the code. And I said, well, it all needs revamped, and here we are. <laughs> so we're going to call it the Cody Liberty Square Overlay. Cody amendment. <laughs> the Cody Amendment. <laughs> this, Ron? Earth sign should fit this requirement, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, Mr. Mayor, we think it would be best at this point because we're going to bring this back to, for readings. Uh, at the uh, March meeting, March 9th. Yep. And so you can let Irv know if all goes well, it should be approved. On the March last 9th. conversation I had with him, I told him it was going to take a, a little bit of time yep. and give me some time. And so we're trying to speed up to get this part done versus waiting for the whole that, thing. That'll be that'll be really nice. I just yep. wasn't sure if you wanted B and S to go do it or you want no, me. No. I can do it. That's fine. That's we awesome. We elected the mayor. To awesome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. It'll be back for readings. Yeah. Oh, does he? Okay. Oh yeah. Well, you can. We're just going to do it at the next then. meeting, and we'll do the. You can let you yeah. can let them know. That's fine. But I think he'll be. I think he'll be happy. Yeah, that's. I'm fine with that too. Yeah. 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 Oh. So you buy your coffee or something? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, any other discussion? <laughs> All right. Can we have roll call, please? Member Allison. Yes. Seely. Yes. Connell. Yes. Shemmers. Yes. Wilburn. Yes. Mossman. Yes. Don't pack up yet. We have another hour. <laughs> Council updates. Council Member Allisey. I have none. Council Member Seeley. I do not have any either. Council Member Connell. I'm good, thank you. Shimmers. <laughs> Council Member Obrin. Nothing. Council Member Musman, you have any updates? 
All right. Make sure you go to the City of Clinton YouTube page and check out the Mayor's Spotlight. We are adjourned. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.